Hi, everyone, and welcome to ARC Chair Training for Alternate Assessment Participation Guidelines. My name is Dr. Lara Clark with NKCES, and I am thrilled to be here with you today. Throughout the training, you will see some keywords pop up. You'll see this slide, and I'll share a keyword. You'll want to capture that keyword um, down on your notes, and you will use those keywords at the end of the training to take the quiz that will help you earn your uh, PD or ELA certificate. When you complete that quiz uh, that's listed on the training guide, um, it will generate a PD or ELA certificate directly to your email. So let's dive in. You know, we know as ARC chairs, you have so many rocks that you manage every day um, in our, you know, our daily sandbox of life. And whether you are a principal, assistant principal, school guidance counselor, or in a different administrative role serving as an ARC chair, your day is complex and full. We run from activity to activity, supporting students, supporting teachers and parents, and then um, jump into an ARC meeting. And so we wanted to take just a second to kind of pause and uh, give you the opportunity to reflect in an ARC meeting where we are focusing on supporting a student and family in making this very difficult decision as to whether or not a student should participate in alternative assessment, it's really important that we you know, take a few deep breaths, recenter ourselves, and really think about the things we know we need to focus on. Because when we are in those ARC meetings where we're dealing with a large amount of data, um, we are working through systematically the requirements and um, working with all the ARC team members, including the student and the parents to make a best decisions for that student. It's really important that we focus on not just the data, which is super important, the, our, big, our biggest rock. Um, we're focusing on the requirements, another big rock. We also need to be focusing on that student and parents really watching their verbals and nonverbals, making sure that we're pausing often in the meeting to give families a minute to kind of think, process, breathe, ask questions, and that we're really open and receptive to those questions and giving our own verbal and nonverbal cues uh, to the family that we are open for questions. You know, this is a discussion where we want to be supportive, uh, please ask us. So I encourage you on uh, this slide in your notes to take a few notes about ways that you can make sure that you're giving good verbals and nonverbals, and also the verbals and nonverbals you're watching for to make sure families are on board and, and clearly indicating that they understand uh, what we're talking about and what's going on in the meeting. So if you haven't already, please pause the video for a second, take a few notes, and then jump back in when you're ready. So let's start our conversation at the very beginning. You know, we're in an ARC meeting to discuss alternate partic assessment participation, and this really only uh, affects a very small percentage of our students. It isn't just for students who don't test well or students who are stressed by testing. Alternate assessment is only for students with the most significant cognitive disabilities who comprise on average 1% of our entire student population. This conversation can be very challenging for families. So it really is one that we want to handle with all care and support. I can share with you as the mom of Dan, who was on alternate assessment throughout his elementary, middle and high school careers, that every time we came to the table to talk about alternate assessment and to develop IEPs, those were hard moments and conversations for my husband, my children and myself. And I always appreciated it when ARC chairs and ARC committee members, you know, took a moment to just stop, make eye contact and say, how are you doing? Is everything okay? Anything I can answer for you? Um, those, those brief moments really helped us make it through those very challenging meetings, not because of anything that the district was doing or that the ARC chair or the teachers were doing, but just that emotionally, you know, these were hard moments for us uh, to really face our son's very significant 
cognitive and uh, and behavioral disabilities and come face to face with a significant change in dreams we had for our child. So, you know, from my mother heart um, to you, I just really encourage you to take moments um, to connect with the family, connect with your students and acknowledge that you understand, you know, these can be some challenging moments. There are a few big concepts that I wanted to share with you when we're talking about alternate assessment. There are a few just global um, best practices we need to take into account as educators. And that first um, big rock we need to think about is the concept called the least dangerous assumption, which um, was first put out in the literature decades ago. But that least dangerous assumption tells us that in the absence of conclusive data, our educational decisions need to be based on the assumption which, if we make this decision, will have the least dangerous effect on the likelihood that our students are going to be able to function independently as adults. We always want to look at every decision we make and make that least dangerous assumption. If we decide X, is this going to support Dan in being as independent as possible as an adult? That frame is super important. We want to always go into a conversation with the um, background thought and one that we share. We know that every student you know, in an ARC meeting, we know that Dan can learn if we teach in a way that he can access the content. We are always going to presume competence and assume that there is something that we can do, increasing communication supports or instructional supports or behavioral supports to help our students make progress. And if we keep these three rocks along with this last rock in our head and as part of our conversations, um, we will really support our families. And we've all probably heard this phrase in a number of different settings, but it really applies when we are in those ARC meetings for alternate assessment. And that's the concept of embracing the power of yet. You know, um, Dan might not be effectively using his communication system yet, but we're going to try this new strategy. So thinking through that power of yet and what can we do, what can we change to ensure that our students are able to make progress. We know that in what we call instructional inadequacy, a term that was coined with the least dangerous assumption literature, doesn't mean that the teacher is doing a poor job. It doesn't mean that the district isn't doing everything possible. It just may mean that the team hasn't yet found the just right fit of supports that our student needs in order to make progress. So on this slide in your notes, I just encourage you to jot down a few thoughts about how you can use these concepts as an ARC chair to support the ARC team members in making the best possible decisions for your students. In your training guide, there were quite a few resources that were linked in. And if you didn't get a chance to print them out, I am all about saving trees and paper. Um, but in this instance, it's really a great idea to have these resources actually printed out in front of you because we're going to move back and forth between the resources and um, throughout the training. It's also a great idea to have a pen handy and um, one in a nice bright color so you can see your notes. A highlighter, um, I'll encourage you in several different places on the document to highlight key language and some post-its or flags so you can tag those resources that you know that you will be using. So this is a PDF a screen grab of the participation guidelines. Um, it's titled the Kentucky Alternate Assessment Participation Guidelines Documentation Form. This is the PDF version. You'll be working in Infinite Campus um, to complete this form. It is a really good idea to print this form out and share a copy with parents or ARC team members who might not have uh, their computer up and open so that you, as you walk through each question in the ARC meeting that everyone um, is able to visually see what we're talking about and follow along. We're going to be going through this form um, question by question to look at each element and make some notes as we go forward. You also should have printed out this guidance for ARCs on participation decisions for the Kentucky Alternate Assessment. We often refer to this as the directions. It's step by step what you need to know to make decisions during that ARC meeting. And you'll want to make sure you're following that carefully. 
The other document you'll want to have with you is the participation guidelines for the Kentucky Alternate Assessment Review Document. KDE does a wonderful job of giving us review documents for every single decision that we would be making in ARC meetings. And we refer to this one quite often as the scoring guide. You know, it's how um, other people that might have a cause to review um, your ARC meeting and the records, they're going to score or make decisions on whether the meeting was handled appropriately or inappropriately using this review document. So, you know, with anything that we do, we want to make sure that we're going to meet compliance. We want to make sure that we're going to meet the requirements. Um, and so using that scoring guide to self-score in advance is a really wise idea. So let's take a deeper look into the guidance document. Pages three through eight have great resources for districts on the process of making that alternate assessment decision. On the bottom of page nine, there is an excellent piece of information for parents we're going to dive into. And you'll want to make sure that you follow this document carefully because it aligns very carefully with that record review document for the participation guidelines. All right, so let's dive into this document. We are starting on page three, and I would encourage you to highlight this section that talks about options for inclusion in state assessment. Notice that there are multiple options for inclusion in our state assessments, and we must consider those options in order. So we're going to talk about them and document them in the conference summary notes that we've had this discussion. We're going to start by talking about if this student could participate in the general assessment without any accommodations, yes or no. If the answer is yes, why is that true? We're going to state some data if it's not true. Again, with data, state why is that not true? Then we're going to look at if that student is not able to participate without accommodations, could they participate in the general assessment with accommodations? Again, yes or no, based on the data. In the conference summary notes, you need to document why the ARC made that decision. If the answer to that is no, they could not participate with accommodation, then you are going to consider participation in the alternate assessment with accommodations, a really important section to make sure you're documenting step by step. Oh, sorry, I went too fast. On page four, there is a fantastic section here that has guiding questions for the ARC. You will notice that this um, box repeats in multiple sections throughout this guidance document and really has fantastic questions that you can ask and also make sure your documentation is clear in those conference summary notes. So for example, that guiding question one, can the student, and in the ARC meetings, we're going to, you know, mention students by name. So can Dan participate in the general assessment without accommodations? <coughs> With accommodations. <coughs> Excuse my coughing. Sorry. The ARC must review and document all accommodations available for the general assessment. If you haven't already done this, I'd encourage you to pause the video, read through those questions. And if there is any question that you're not sure how you would document in your district, make a note so that you can follow up with your director of special education. Note that question three specifically addresses students who are English learners and English learners with a significant cognitive disability. How will you um, address and support that student? So excellent guidance on those first two pages. Moving on to page nine, I would encourage you to highlight this section first. Before a student can be found eligible for the Kentucky Alternate Assessment, we have to go through the participation criteria step by step, and every question has to be answered yes in order for that student to be eligible. Note this paragraph. This one I would highlight and give it a star. Maybe put one of your flags or post-it notes here. Any ARC member, including the parents who need further clarification of any term or criteria used in the participation guidelines, should refer to this guidance for annual review committees, or the ARCs, on participation decisions for the Kentucky Alternate Assessment or the Parent Guide to the Alternate K Prep. So key resources we want to make sure we're sharing with parents, and that is 
one of the key requirements, the very first question we're going to answer. All right, so grab your Kentucky Alternate Assessment Participation Guidelines documentation form, and we're gonna take a few notes here. And um, the first question, um, we need this answer to be yes. So if you have not currently done this, you want to make sure before you move forward that you can answer yes. The first question um, is specific to uh, the parent being provided with a copy of the Kentucky Alternate Assessment Parent Guide. That guide was linked into your training guide as one of your resources. So note that we not only have to provide the parent with a copy, but we also need to provide them with an opportunity to ask questions. Underline that phrase. So it's two things. I've given you a copy and I've given you an opportunity to ask questions. In the conference summary notes, you will want to document both of those things. You really want to think about the um, con uh, conference summary notes in this documentation form. There should be a match between those two. So you're checking yes here, and then you're documenting in the conference summary notes how that happened. So note here that we have several choices. It could be documented prior to the meeting, during the meeting, or in some other way, and you want to include the date that it was given to the parents. In the conference summary notes, it's really important for you to document that opportunity to answer questions. Keep in mind, as we said early in this training, this is a big decision for parents. Even if this is one that we've talked about, you know, from the time this student was in elementary school, we've really supported parents in conversation prior to the meeting. It's still a big decision. So um, it's important to really watch those verbals and nonverbals of parents and provide support. If you are an ARC chair for an elementary parent, and this is the first time they are talking about alternate assessment, they might have tons and tons of questions. If you are um, a ARC chair in middle school or high school, and this is a conversation that's happened many times in elementary school, um, then parents might not have as many questions, but you still want to offer to answer them and document that conversation. So let's dive deeper. We want to make sure that throughout that meeting, we're taking care of ourselves and our entire ARC team, including those parents and students, that we are really thinking through how we can support families and staff. Sometimes that's by really supporting our staff prior to the meeting, you know, maybe a few months prior to the meeting, making sure that staff have the time needed to pull together documentation. You know, they might need to have some planning time where the speech and language pathologist and the special education teacher are sitting down together and making sure they have all the data that they need so that an ARC can make an informed decision. In no way are we making any predeterminations, but rather we're planning to make sure we have the data we need so that when the ARC comes together um, with the family and with our students, that we can analyze that data fully and uh, then make that decision. We're also really, again, focusing on those verbals and nonverbals. A few of you might be thinking, goodness gracious, Laura, you've mentioned this multiple times already. And I will continue to mention it just because um, not only from my teacher brain, but from my mama heart, I can tell you that I've been in uh, meetings where we missed some verbal cues or some nonverbal cues, and then the meeting ended up not going as well. Where if we had noted that in the very beginning and just paused to breathe, and you know, had that family share with us their questions or their concerns, or just give them a few minutes to vent and you know, express their frustration or their sadness that we could have moved forward in a productive meeting. Breathing is always good. So our first key word um, is the word support, because we know that as an ARC chair and as an ARC team, we are there to support the family. So jot down that word on your keyword list, support. So we are headed back to that um, guidance document. And here I am going to encourage you to highlight this sentence. It's super important to document in the conference summary that the parents were given that guide and that, uh, that conversation that happened. So if a parent asked a question, we're documenting the question and then how we answered that question. Um, documentation is important, not just to document the actual, just the facts, ma'am, 
just the facts, sir. But why was that decision made? You want to make sure that there's very clear logic so that anyone reading those notes later would say, oh, okay, that makes perfect sense. Not, hmm, I have no idea why they made that decision. They said they reviewed this data, but I have no idea what decision was made in this ARC. You want to make sure um, that you are documenting carefully that you have not only sent home the meeting notice invitation, but that you've provided a copy of the parent guide to the families in their native language <coughs> and document that discussion in your conference summary notes. All right, so we are moving to page 11 and focusing in on those guiding questions. This is a great box to highlight and star some great questions to make sure you answer and if this is the first time you're running an ARC meeting, it's good to have that out and make sure that you are checking through each question that you have documented. So affirming that we're really taking time to give parents the information they need in their native language. Um, if they need something interpreted, that we're providing that interpretation. If they need an interpreter in the meeting, we're providing that and that they had opportunities to ask questions. We know that conference summary documentation is crucial. Um, if the parent was not in attendance, we need to carefully document every attempt that was made to contact the parent, the methods that we used to contact them, and that those methods be um, varied. All right, so we're back to the documentation form and we're moving down into that next question. We've given the parent guide, check, now we're talking about the difference between the alternative high school diploma and a regular high school diploma. What are those two diplomas and what do they mean? So let's dive a little bit deeper into what those two things look like and how that conversation can go. Um, the first thing I would encourage you to do in your guidance document on page 12 is to highlight this box because this is what you'll want to make sure you explain to parents carefully. We're going to explain the differences between the high school diploma and an alternative high school diploma. And keep in mind that an alternate high school diploma must include the Kentucky alternate assessment aligned to the Kentucky academic standards content strands and the Kentucky employment and foundational academic standards, sometimes called EFAS. It's important to note that both diploma types require a minimum of 22 credits and both diploma types um, are um, also have to take into account local district requirements in addition to the credit requirements at the state level. You'll note that with the alternative high school diploma, the language there is that, is that it is provided to students with significant cognitive disabilities. I would underline that phrase, and then I would also underline the phrase unable to meet requirements for a regular high school diploma. So they are going to complete the required alternate course of study. And for many families, it's important to note that there is a very specific course of study for students who are on alternate assessment, that they are still receiving high quality instruction. To help parents understand the difference, one suggestion is to walk a family through the different course descriptions between courses in a regular diploma track and an alternative diploma track. This screenshot is from the Kentucky Searchable Course Code Database. Here, we searched for English 1. There are quite a few skills to cover based on the Kentucky academic standards, and it is a quite complex curriculum for the English 1 course required on a regular diploma. If you would like to access this and provide this information to parents in a meeting, there is a hyperlink to the database here at the bottom of the slide in the light pink box. If you're interested in sharing with families the descriptions for students working towards an alternative high school diploma, you can type 600 in the box, uh, in the search box specifically. <coughs> Results will show all classes for students on the alternate high school diploma or students that are already eligible for alternate assessment. Note here that for English 1, for students on alternate assessment, it states that all materials and activities are differentiated to meet individualized student needs based on the Kentucky academic standards 
and the Kentucky Employability and Foundational Academic Standards. So keep in mind, when we're talking about alternate assessment courses, we are moving from covering the, covering the entire breadth and depth of the Kentucky Academic Standards for a grade level, including all academic standards, just like an entire um, forest floor full of flowers. We've got breadth, we've got depth. We are moving to a significantly reduced breadth and depth of content on the Kentucky Alternate Assessment. So helping families understand that we are moving away from all of the detailed nuances that the Kentucky Alternate Assessment on a regular diploma track has. They're not going to learn about the entire picture, but instead focus on one or two key elements within a standard. Giving families clear visuals that will help them um, understand that change in breadth and depth is crucial when we are explaining alternate assessment. This is never a decision that the ARC should be making lightly. An ARC is going to be discussing the decision annually, and it is absolutely possible for a student to move back and forth between a regular diploma track to alternate assessment. But keep in mind, once you start on an alternate assessment track, we are reducing that breadth and depth of content each year, which has a cumulative effect of decreasing a student's access to content and ability to successfully complete the rigors of the Kentucky academic standards on a regular diploma track. This is a great moment to pause and just take a few notes on how you can support a family in understanding the differences between that regular diploma track and alternate diploma track. All right, now that we have considered as an ARC this important decision, let's go back to the review document and make sure that we're highlighting um, in the documentation form. We've already said the ARC must provide a copy of the participation guide or the parent guide and we want to check yes or no if we did that. If we check no, that's non-compliance. And we want to make sure that for item B, that we have explained the difference between the two diplomas. And again, if we check no, that's an issue of non-compliance. Conference summary documentation is absolutely crucial in making sure that you are following the requirements um, for a compliant ARC meeting. Absolutely important. So, I am going to stop video one to give you time to consider all the ways that you've got this. You have the tools you need to have a very successful ARC meeting for the first two elements. So as you pause from video one to video two, I would take some time to think about the explaining the differences between the two diplomas, how you would support support families, verbals and nonverbal cues, and what tools that you might use as an ARC chair. So to make sure you have with you before the meeting, all prepared to share. When you have taken a few notes and made sure that you're solid on this first part, please start video two.